Well, good morning, Grant Memorial. It is good to worship together and dig into the word of the Lord with you. Thank you to the worship team uh, for leading us and uh, for leading us just in so many truths that I know for me as I was singing them was just filled with awe and wonder about how amazing our God is. And uh, yeah, this might be uh, one of those weeks where I go back and, and re-worship uh, later on in the week with this set, just singing such incredible truths. So thank you. Uh, now, last week, uh, we began a sort of a, a series within a series. We are many months and five chapters into the New Testament letter of Galatians, and it's in this fifth chapter that we come across a list which Paul refers to as the fruit of the Spirit. And this list consists of nine characteristics that will be evident in the lives of those who have the Holy Spirit residing within them. And so what we're doing for the summer is we're taking a look at each of these characteristics one by one for nine weeks to explore just what Paul is talking about and what it means for us. And so while we're still in our study of Galatians, we haven't moved on to something else, and we will pick up uh, the text in chapter 6 for the first couple of weeks of, of September uh, once our discussion about the fruit of the Spirit comes to an end. But our focus for the summer is not the letter as a whole, but rather the nature of this fruit that Paul goes out of his way to describe as the consequence of God's indwelling in the lives of his people. And uh, if you missed last week's message, I encourage you to go to our website and watch uh, Dom Gibson's introduction to this series within a series, which lays the groundwork for these nine weeks of summer. But to begin this morning, uh, would you open your copy of the scriptures as we read our summer text in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And you're going to hear this uh, text uh, for, the, for the next eight weeks. So for nine weeks in a row, this is our text. And uh, let's, let's read it. It's uh, chapter 5, starting at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we dig into your word this morning, that you would highlight uh, this text for us. God, I pray that as we read this verse week in and week out, that, uh, that we would continue to learn more from the living word of God. God, we pray that this, uh, this short two-verse passage would mean so much to us that it would teach us so much about ourselves, about who you are, and about what our lives uh, can look like by abiding in your spirit. I pray that we would be changed as a result of encountering your word this summer uh, and specifically today. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this week, uh, we find ourselves at the second characteristic on this list that we just read. Now, notice that I didn't say the second fruit on this list, and that's on purpose. As Dom taught last week, the fruit of the Spirit are not simply nine distinct fruits, but are rather nine parts of one fruit. So the image that we should have in our heads is that of an orange with its many slices or a pomegranate made up of many pieces rather than a variety bowl of fruit as is often presented when this topic is taught. And the reason for this distinction is so important. Uh, It's that the characteristics on this list are not to be seen as separate from one another. This, this is not a checklist that we mark ourselves on. Like, oh, I'm good at kindness, not so much with the self-control. No, the fruit of the Spirit is not the fruit of Cam or the fruit of Dave, Tom, Shelley, or Kim. This is not about your strengths and weaknesses or, or even a list for you to aspire to work to become. The fruit here is from 
the Spirit, meaning these characteristics are the characteristics that will be evident or will be growing in the life of a Christian because the one who is in you is these things. So this is not, uh, or, or this is kind of an all or nothing situation. This package of characteristics is the fruit or the consequence of God's indwelling of his people. And if God is within you, he is not only within you in one way or another. The fullness of the Spirit of God is within you. And as we learn to keep in step with the Spirit, the output of our lives will be more and more like the Spirit of God. Not simply in one aspect or another, but completely. Which changes the way we look at the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't it? Right? If these things that we read, these characteristics, come from God, it is because they are first God's characteristics. So it must be said first and foremost that God is love. God is joyful. God is peaceful. God is patient. God is kind. God is good. God is faithful. God is gentle. And God is self control. These are the characteristics of God. This is what the Spirit of God is like. And so it follows that if we have the Spirit of God in us, these are the characteristics that will pour out through us from the Spirit that is within us. And and this is so important because the tendency for us as we read this text is to forget about God and to make ourselves the main character in this text, right? I'm like this. Oh, I need to be more like that. I should probably work at that rather than resting in the fact that because God is these things, he can and will work them out in us from the inside out, right? God, as always, is the main character in the text. In this list, we learn what the Spirit of God is like, and we read the promise that he will be these things through us if we let him indwell us and if we keep in step with him. We are not the subjects here of this passage. We are the conduits through which God lives out his life in us, right? In the same way that a light switch does not produce power on its own, but rather when it's flipped on, it lets the power simply flow through it. So too, we are not on the hook to produce power by our own work, to produce these characteristics by our own work, but rather we're invited to open ourselves that the power of the Spirit might flow right through us. So a Christian then is not someone who simply does certain things or acts in certain ways. A Christian is a vessel through which God does and acts in certain ways. And this is the consistent biblical teaching of Christian living. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 2 Timothy 1.14 says, The Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Ephesians 2.22 says, We are a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Colossians 1.27 says, Christ is in us. Hebrews 3.6 says, We are the house of Christ. Jesus in his discourse in John 14 talks about each member of the Trinity individually making their abode or dwelling within us. Or as Paul wrote earlier in this letter of Gal- in, in Galatians, in chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Anytime, church, we get to passages about Christian character or living, we need to realize that it's not about us gritting our teeth and making it happen. It's about us tuning in to what God is doing. It's literally being God's hands and feet where we find ourselves, letting him work through us because it's not my nature. It's not your nature to be fully loving, patient, gentle, self-controlled. But it is in God's nature. As theologian uh, Thomas Schreiner says, as Christians, we please God only through relying on the Spirit. The Christian life 
is not an exercise in autonomy or self-effort, but is lived in dependence on the Holy Spirit. So with all that said, I think it's important that as we walk through this series, each week, in one way or another, we're going to answer each of the following three questions. The first question I want to answer every week is, what is this characteristic, right? What are we talking about with this word on the list? Then the next question I think we need to answer is, how is God this characteristic, Right? Do we see God to be these things in the scriptures and how? And then the third question is, what does it look like then for God to embody this within us? Now notice that third question was not, how can I be more blank? That's not the question we're going to ask, but rather, what does it look like for us to be the instruments of this fruit Okay, so this is the template that I'm hoping to employ so that we get a broader picture of what the fruit of the Spirit is and that we leave each week focusing on how great God is rather than how much work we have to do. Can I say that again? I I want us each week as we study the fruit of the Spirit to walk away focusing on how amazing God is rather than how much work we have to do. But isn't that the way that Sunday mornings can often feel? We leave feeling bad about how far we are away from where we should be, how much we need to do to become who God has created us to be. What I want to resonate with us over the summer is just how much we need God to work in us and how incredible it is that he promises to do so if we let him. Now, just briefly, I want to point out, although not as explicitly, this template is precisely what Dom walked us through last week regarding this, the first characteristic of love. He unpacked what love is. He emphasized God's incredible love for us, that God is love, as we read in 1 John. And he shared how God's loving nature compels us to love, to love with the love of Christ. And again, I encourage you, if you haven't yet, to go to the website and check out that message uh, to get a a good start into where we're going to be this summer. But back to where we started this morning in our text. We're looking at the second characteristic in the Apostle Paul's list, the characteristic of joy. So if what we have said is true about the nature of the fruit of the Spirit, the assumed statement at the onset that I'd like to make is, If the God of joy is in you, joy will pour out of you. Okay, that's that's the assumption that we're making if this is true about the nature of the fruit of the Spirit. If the God of joy is in you, joy will pour out of you. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say that? If the God of joy is in you, joy will pour out of you. And to unpack this, let's start off by asking our first question. The first question is, what is joy? And here we already hit our first roadblock. Because joy is a hard thing to define, isn't it? How would you define joy? Well, the word that, uh, that Paul uses here for joy uh, is the Greek word kara, which means exceeding gladness or, or great delight. But it implies something that's not caught in those words. It implies a steadiness or a a settledness that allows this gladness or delight to persist no matter the circumstances within which we find ourselves. So it's, it's more of a state of the heart than a state of being. So if I were to take a crack at defining joy... Uh, partially because I couldn't find a really great definition that I loved this week. Uh, This is the definition that, that I would suggest. Joy is a settled gladness in the heart, not dependent on circumstances, but confident and rooted in the love and promises of God. Okay, let's read that again. Joy is a settled gladness in the heart, not dependent on circumstances, but confident and rooted in the love and promises of God. So that will be our working definition for our conversation today. And this moves us into that second question. 
if that's joy, how then is God joyful? All right? How is God joyful? If, if this characteristic is lived through us by God, how does God himself display joy? Now, first of all, how many of us have thought about God as joyful before? Is that a, a characteristic that we have attributed to him? Uh, for some of you, maybe you've thought, you think about God in that way. For others, this may be a new concept to think about the joy of God. Dallas Willard, in his book, The Divine Conspiracy, says of God, he says, God is full of joy. Undoubtedly, he is the most joyous being in the universe. The abundance of his love and generosity is inseparable from his infinite joy. All of the good and beautiful things from which we occasionally drink tiny droplets of soul-exhilarating joy, God continuously experiences in all their breadth and depth and richness. So here, Willard hints that everything we experience, all the things that bring us delight, God experiences in full, much beyond our experience, right? Can you imagine that? That's a fun picture maybe of what heaven will be like when we consider that compared to here, right? So if we delight in relationships, well, God experiences perfect relationship amongst the Trinity, Right? Or if we delight in beauty or creation, well, God, as the designer, the creator, delights in his handiwork all the more. Uh, later in his book, Willard gives the example of a beautiful view that quiets your soul and satisfies with awe and wonder that brings us joy. Have you ever witnessed one of those views? There are less in Manitoba than there are in other parts of the world, but you know what I'm talking about. When you have one of those views and you just, you're settled and you're in awe and wonder. Now take that moment and multiply it. Willard says that, that we catch a glimpse. God views that from every possible angle. And he sees it in its entirety. He sees it completely and surely takes delight in it. So that momentary joy, that momentary awe that we experience, God sees completely from every angle, everywhere it could possibly be seen. And this extends to all of his creation, from mountain ranges to the galaxies above, and including the personalities of those he has created in his own image. Grandparents, think of the joy that your grandkids give you. Multiply that. God is the father of all, right? He experiences joy that we couldn't possibly even imagine. We worship and serve and know a joyful creator. Psalm 104 confirms this. It says, the Lord shall rejoice, take joy, in his creation. Genesis 1.31, we read that when God looked upon all he had made, he declared it very good, right? He was satisfied. It brought him joy, right? God takes delight in his creation. And, and beyond that, he takes delight in us witnessing. No, let me reword that. This is a confusing statement, but I'm going to say it anyways. God takes delight in witnessing us take delight in what he has done. Does that make sense? God takes delight in watching us take delight in what he has done. So let me ask you, what's the first thing that you do when you hear a beautiful song or eat a delicious meal? Right? Other than maybe just enjoying that moment. If you're like me, you want to tell others about it. Right? You invite others to experience it too. You've got to taste this. You've got to hear this song. Right? It brings us joy in sharing what brings joy. And even more so if it's something that we have made or labored over. Well, God delights in sharing what he has made with us that we might find delight in it. And further, God experiences joy in extending to us the salvation of our souls, that we may be with him in joyful relationship for eternity. Simply, it brings God joy to save us. Isaiah 12, 3 says, With joy, God will draw water from the wells of salvation. Or Hebrews 12, 2, 
It says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Right? Which means that Jesus endured the cross because it brought him joy to do so. He was settled and content in his love and the fulfillment of the promise to come, the salvation of the world. Remember our definition. Joy is a settled gladness in the heart, not dependent on circumstances, but confident and rooted in the love and promises of God. Well, who could be more confident in the love and promises of God than God himself? Who knows completely when we see everything, oh, so dim. There's a passage of scripture found in Nehemiah 8.10 where Nehemiah declares that the joy of the Lord will be the strength of his people. Now, I think that often when we read this verse, we're reading it as if it's our joy in God that is our strength. But that's not it. It's the joy of the Lord. It's God's joy that gives us strength. His joy to save us. His joy to walk with us. His joy that places within us, uh, his joy that he places within us by his spirit that gives us strength. Right? Our God is full of joy. And because our God is full of joy, when we are filled by his spirit, true joy is ours as well. Which brings us to the third question. What does his joy look like in us? Right? What does God's joy look like in us? Or what does joy look like for me or for you? Other than just kind of taping a smile on or something. How, what does this look like? What does this mean for me? And while I usually don't like to do this, uh, for clarity's sake and because we tend to mistake joy for other things... I think that for this particular characteristic, we may do best to explore what joy looks like for us by defining what it doesn't look like for us, or by pointing out what joy isn't. So first of all, joy is not happiness, right? I think that's important for us to know. Joy is not happiness. Actually, let me state that a little bit differently. Joy is not simply happiness, one of the things that makes it hard for us to define joy or to identify it in our lives is that we have a hard time articulating how these two concepts are different, how joy and happiness are not simply interchangeable words. And this is confirmed by, beyond our intellectual definitions to include the way we apply these concepts to our own perceptions of our states of being. So when things are going well for us, we believe that we're joyful people. But when things go against us, we feel as though something is sapping our joy. When really what we're referring to is happiness. That emotion that comes and goes as our circumstances change. Uh, just a couple of months ago, when the Jets swept the Oilers in the first round, we were all very happy. But that happiness quickly faded four games later when Montreal returned the favor to us. It turns out that it was not joy that we felt. And that's evident because of how quickly our joy vanished. Happiness is a temporary feeling, while joy is a condition of the heart. Remember, we defined that earlier. And I'm going to say that again. While happiness is a temporary feeling, joy is a condition of the heart. Now, uh, there's a little bit of a disclaimer. We need to be careful here. Because while it is true that joy is not happiness, it must also be said that joy is not not happiness. <laughs> I think that makes sense, right? It makes sense to me. I, I think sometimes in an attempt to distinguish joy from happiness, we pit them against each other, trivializing happiness as something synthetic or somehow the antithesis of real joy. It's somehow a negative thing to be happy, which couldn't be further from the truth. I would say that one of the byproducts of joy is happiness, right? Those who are joyful, whose hearts are in a joyful state, confident in Christ's saving work, are and should be noticeably happy. Not always, but sometimes for sure, right? 
Unfortunately, we all know that Christian who claims to be uh, full of the joy of the Lord, but we know that they're a miserable human being, right? Well, I would venture a guess that if someone is miserable, their hearts aren't filled with joy. You see, while it is true that happiness does not produce joy, joy should, to an extent, produce happiness, right? Our, Our circumstantial feelings, being happy that something went my way, does not indicate a joyful heart on the inside. But a joyful heart on the inside ought to overflow in a way that is evident to those around us on the outside, no matter the circumstances, right? Happiness is one byproduct of joy, but they certainly are not the same thing because happiness depends on circumstance. In fact, there's another H word that is much closer to joy than happiness is, and that word is hope. If, if we were to confuse joy with anything, it ought to be hope. Because joy sees past right now. And it hopes in what is to come. Right? What enables our hearts to remain joyful, even when we're not happy, is the hope that this is not all there is. These circumstances are not final They're a blip on the radar of the good plan of God that ends incredibly. Have you ever watched a movie or a sporting event when you already knew the ending? It's amazing how differently we experience that movie or that book or that sporting event, isn't it? Right? If we already know that the good guys win... We're not as devastated when things look bleak or when things don't go the way we would like them to. Right? Similarly, we can experience hardship with hopefulness, even joyfully, if we know that there is more to come. And church, we know there is more to come. No matter what we face in this life, our hope is in what is to come. And the scriptures tell us that the good guys win. That no sickness will prevail, Revelation 21.4. That no heartache will last, Psalm 147, 3. That no challenge won't be overcome, John 16, 33. That not even death is final for those who know Christ and have put their hope in him, 1 Corinthians 15. That is where joy comes from. And that is what makes joy different from happiness. Because happiness puts its hope in what we see. While joy puts hope in what we know. Church, let us not settle for happiness when true joy is available. But unfortunately for many, we've become satisfied with chasing happiness that we have missed joyfully hoping for more. In his book, The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis writes, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling around or fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. So one of the answers to what does joy look like in us is that it looks like hope, right? Hope beyond what we see and joy beyond momentary happiness. May the Spirit help us not to settle when true joy is available. Which leads us to our next point and carries on this thought. Joy is not circumstantial. So joy is not happiness. Joy is also not circumstantial. Uh, This was included directly in our definition from earlier, right? Joy is not based on circumstances. Joy, unlike happiness, is not fleeting and is not linked to the cards that we have been dealt. And the reason I bring this up and didn't just include it in with happiness is that it's important to know that true biblical joy is often most obviously seen in the midst of difficult circumstances. Listen to Christ's scriptural command to be joyful in Matthew 5, 12. 
He says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and say all, uh, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And then he finishes with rejoice and be glad. Right? I, I don't think anyone would mistake these circumstances as positive. Right? Being insulted, persecuted, lied about, not ideal circumstances, not happy times. But Christ says you can have joy in even these circumstances. Or especially these circumstances. Listen to what Paul shares about his experience when he was first in Galatia, right? He's writing back to the Galatians, but the first time he was here it didn't go super smoothly for him. Uh, Acts 13:50 says this. But the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. Again, not great circumstances, I'd say. So how do Paul and Barnabas respond? Verse 52 says, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Right? Their, their joy was not connected to their circumstances. It didn't depend on ease or comfort. Their joy was linked to the state of their heart because of the Spirit's work within them. Right? In ease and in persecution. In acceptance and in rejection, the disciples were full of joy. Which is why Christians can walk through even the darkest of times, maybe not always with a smile on their face, but can still have joy in their hearts. Because as 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9 says, while we are hard pressed on every side, we are not crushed. We may be perplexed, but we do not despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Church, we see our circumstances through an eternal lens. And that impacts the way we walk through them. One pastor shares the story of a man who is suffering through brain cancer and its treatments. And his relationship with Jesus was such that a nurse who was on duty wrote as a critical comment in his chart, Mr. X is inappropriately joyful. <laughs> Church, our relationship with Jesus and our hope in our future with him ought to be such that we are seen by others as inappropriately joyful. Because while our circumstances say one thing, our assurance in the promises of God tells us quite another. And the third uh, thing that joy is not or does not do is kind of on the flip side of this last point, but it's important to know as we discuss what joy looks like for us is that joy does not downplay difficulty. Right? So joy is not happiness. It doesn't depend on circumstances, but it doesn't downplay difficulties. You see, joy is not interested in suppressing sorrow, in minimizing pain, or trivializing our trials. Right? That's not what we're talking about when we talk about real joy. Joy does not demand that we simply and tritely keep our chin up or turn our frowns upside down. Right? That's not what joy is. No, joy names what is wrong and experiences it deeply and grieves well because it knows what is wrong is not final. In John eleven thirty five, 35, we read the most easily memorized verse in Scripture. Jesus wept. If you haven't memorized that, memorize it now. You can check that off your list of to do today. You see, Christ who knows the ending better than any of us, did not ride into this scene where his friend Lazarus had died, minimizing the sorrow. He didn't come in telling everyone to get it together. No, he grieved. He lamented death. He felt the pain. But his hope remained in the final chapter. 
in the ending he knew would make it all right. Church, joy doesn't run from difficulties. Looking for a happiness high somewhere else. Joy doesn't act as if we're all right when we're not. Joy embraces the hardships, lives through the difficulties, but comes out the other side with joyful hearts because this too will pass. You see, joy allows us to get into the ditch with others, to mourn with those who mourn, to label correctly what is not right, but not to despair because we know that one day every wrong will be made right. You see, joy means that we can be honest in the hard times. Not insincerely looking for a silver lining to boost our happiness, to save the moment as if this moment is all we have. True joy lets us live authentically in every moment, not looking for a way out of it, but keeping our eyes fixed on what is above all of it. So friends, as we invite the Spirit to produce joy in our lives, may we be looking less for happiness, ideal circumstances, or numbness, avoidance, but rather may we, be, may we open ourselves up to the Spirit, giving us a hope beyond today, perspective in our circumstances, and the ability to authentically walk through the moments in which we find ourselves. Because we know that in these moments, because of God's presence in us, we are not alone. As the psalmist writes in Psalm 23, 4, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Dare we add, I will be joyful. Why? For you are with me. As missionary Amy Carmichael is quoted as saying, Joy is a gift from God that is ours today because Christ is here. It's ours tomorrow because Christ will be there. And it's ours forever because he will never leave us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that gift. That no matter where we walk, we do not walk alone. And that the path, no matter what it looks like right now, leads home to where you are, to where our joy will be made complete. Amen. We will never know a love that is anywhere comparable to the love that we are invited into through Christ with God. In 1 Peter, we read this. It says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. I, I hope that is what was happening as you were singing, as you were uh, singing this kind of love song of sorts to God. But the verse goes on and it says, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Right? The inexpressible and glorious joy. Why do we have that? Because the end of our faith is salvation. And salvation is uh, just an uninterrupted connection and relationship with that God who has given us absolutely everything, right? Salvation is the real reason for our joy. It changes everything, and it ought to change everything. I was talking with someone today, and they, they posed me the question, what difference does it make that you're a Christian? And I almost didn't know what to say, because I think it makes all the difference. I think it changes absolutely everything everything. Not because I'm somehow living in a different world or I'm sheltered from problems or anything, but because of the joy 
that the Spirit allows me to have as I walk through every moment of every day. May that be what we walk through our days with. Not that everything is happy. It is not a shield that is around us that will protect us from difficult circumstances. But that as the Spirit is working within us, that we would have that settled gladness in our hearts no matter what the circumstances. And that every moment, from the little thing to the big thing, above it all, we would be so confident and rooted in the love and promise of God. May we be filled with joy.